Hi, my name is Fraser and welcome to GPU Solutions. In today's video, we have this Asus Astral RTX 5080 that came in for repair. The user reported that there was no display from any of the ports. He also mentioned that the GPU was shipped installed inside the PC from another country and after it landed, the GPU simply stopped working. So in this video, we are going to find out what actually went wrong and see if we can bring this card back to life. If you watched my memory testing USB video, you already seen this exact GPU before. In that video, we ran the memory test and identified that A0 and B1 were the faulty memory banks. I'm not going to run the full test again in this video, but if you're interested in how to diagnose a GDDR6X and GDDR7 memory faults, I really recommend watching that video later. I go into the full process step by step there. Since we already know that A0 and B1 are bad, we can skip straight to the hardware. Let's dismantle the GPU and take a closer look at the PCB. I actually like the design of this GPU. It has four fans, three on the front and one at the back. It's an interesting idea, but I'm not sure how much of a real world difference it makes compared to the normal three fan design. What do you think about this layout? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts and your experience. Taking this card apart is pretty straightforward. First, remove the four screws at the back of the core. Then, remove the two screws on the left of the rear fan and two on the right. After that, take out the three screws on the I.O. panel. Once that's done, the shroud comes off. Just remember, the shroud is connected to the PCB with two connectors. A large connector for the fans and the smaller one for the RGB. Unplug both of those and the shroud is free. Next, we remove the cooler. Just give it a straight lift and it will separate from the PCB. Now, remove the seven screws that hold the back plate to the PCB. Take them out one by one. There's also the fourth fan connector to disconnect here since that fan sits on the back plate. After unplugging it, Push the backplate away with light pressure while holding the PCB securely. With the backplate off, remove the remaining screws on the I.O. panel so the PCB is completely free. I removed all the thermal pads from the memory chip so I could inspect everything properly. After carefully examining the PCB, I couldn't see any cracks or obvious physical damage, which is a good sign considering it was shipped inside a PC. The next step is to deal with the faulty memory modules themselves. Since we already know A0 and B1 are failing, I got the preheater ready and placed the bare PCB on it. I waited for the board temperature to reach around 120 degrees Celsius, then applied flux to the A0 and B1 memory modules. With hot air set to 420 degrees Celsius and about 60% airflow, I gently heated the area and removed both the memory modules. With the chips off, I switched to the soldering iron. I removed the excess unleaded solder from the memory pads, tinned them with leaded solder to bring down the melting temperature and then cleaned everything up with a copper solder wick. Once that was done, I cleaned the A0 and B1 memory area with isopropyl alcohol so I could clearly inspect the pads on the PCB. On A0, I found four broken pads. B1 looked fine at this stage. At that point, I was hoping this was the full extent of the damage. Time to repair the broken pads on A0. To start the repair, I scraped off the solder mask around the damaged pad area to expose some fresh copper for the new pads to anchor to. I began with the first set of pads at the bottom of the PCB near the PCIe slot. I placed the replacement pads on the board and added some wet UV mask into the pad holes so it could act like a glue. I filled the pads right up to the top, positioned the pads and then Cure the mask with UV lamp so that it can harden and held the pads in place. Once the pads were locked in, I applied flux and used the soldering iron to solder the tail of the pads to the traces. 
Then I repeated the same process for the two pads closer to the GPU core. Fill the pad slot with UV mask. Place and align the pads. Cure it with a UV lamp. Then apply flux and solder it down. After all four pads were in place and soldered, I covered the exposed solder joint with UV mask again so the pads were mechanically secured and protected. With the PCB pads repaired, I moved on to the memory modules themselves. Thankfully, all the pads on the memory chips looked intact, so I could reuse the original modules after reballing. For each memory module, I added flux to the chip, removed the excess unleaded solder, tinned it with leaded solder to reduce the melting point, and then wicked the pads flat with the solder wick. Once the chip was clean, I placed it on a stencil holder, applied a thin, even layer of flux, positioned the stencil and dropped 0.45 mm solder balls over it. Then, I reflowed the balls until all flowed and attached properly. With the memory reboard, it was time to put A0 and B1 back on the PCB. I preheated the board again to about 120 degrees Celsius, applied flux both to the PCB pads and to the memory modules, aligned them carefully and then used hot air at 420 degrees Celsius and 60% airflow to solder them back in place. After reinstallation, I let the board cool down fully before testing. Once the board cooled, I went to test it. And here's where I made a small mistake. I forgot to hit the record button on the camera. During the off-camera test, the card still showed an error on B1. So I removed the B1 memory module again to investigate further. This time, before rushing back into reboiling, I measured all the data and command lines. I found that two command lines from B1 weren't actually making contact with the GPU core. Those command line pads run under the GPU core near the same area as the A0 memory bank. That means we were probably dealing with broken solder joints or even broken pads under the GPU core itself. At this point, there was only one way to confirm it. I had to lift the GPU core. To remove the core, I first cleaned out the filler material from all four corners of the GPU. Then, I applied flux around the edges of the core, placed the board back onto my rework station and carefully removed the core from the PCB. With the core off, I prepared the board. I applied flux to the GPU pad area, removed the old unleaded solder, Tin the pads with leaded solder and then use a copper braid to wick everything flat. I followed that with a good cleaning using isopropyl alcohol so I could clearly inspect the area and look for damage. And there it was, one broken pad that connected directly to the command line of the B1 memory module. The repair process here is similar to what I did on A0. Scrape the broken pad area to expose copper on the trace. Fill the empty pad slot with wet UV mask right up to the surface. Place the replacement pad into the mask. Cure the mask with a UV lamp so it holds the pad firmly. Then apply flux and solder the pad tail to the exposed trace. And finally, cover the joint with UV mask again to secure and insulate it. With that hidden command pad repaired, the board side was finally ready. Now, it was time to reball the GPU core itself. I started by applying flux to the core and removed the old unleaded solder from the balls. Then, I tinned the whole array with leaded solder and wicked the pads flat with a copper braid so we had a clean, even surface. Next step, balls. I applied a thin layer of flux to the core, placed the stencil over it and dropped the solder balls on top. This stencil was brand new and not perfect. The cutout of some of the 0.4 mm balls was slightly off. That meant some of the balls didn't make proper contact with the core and stayed stuck inside the stencil. So I had to manually place all the missing balls one by one. It was a tedious job and definitely tested my patience, but eventually, I got every single pad populated correctly. 
After that, I put the core onto the preheater and heated it until all the balls flowed and formed proper joints. Once it cooled, I cleaned the underside of the core with isopropyl alcohol to remove all the used flux. With the core reboiled and the pads repaired, it was time to put it back onto the board. I applied flux both to the PCB and to the GPU core. This helps avoid grey pads and ensures the joints are strong and reliable. Then I aligned the core using the corner markings on the PCB as my guide. There's no mechanical alignment frames here, so it's all about lining it up as accurately as possible by hand. Once I was satisfied with the alignment, I placed the board back onto the rework station and soldered the core in place. After that, I let the board cool down naturally to room temperature. Now comes one of the most important steps after any reball. Checking the rails. I measured the resistance on all the key rails. The memory rail, 1.8 volt rail, 1.2 volts and the PEX rail. On this GPU, all the resistances looked normal. Next, I connected my custom power supply, where I can control and limit the current going into the board. I powered the GPU, checked the actual voltages on those same rails to make sure everything was within spec. This step is critical. It helps make sure the board doesn't instantly burn up due to a short under the GPU core the moment you plug it into a test bench. In our case, all the rails look good, no unexpected current draw and no shots. I also rechecked continuity on the pads that had failed earlier to make sure that the repaired lines now had a solid connection with the GPU core. With the core confirmed good, it was time to install the B1 memory module again. I preheated the board to around 120 degrees Celsius, applied flux both to the PCB and the memory module, aligned B1 carefully over its pads and soldered it back down with hot air at 420 degrees Celsius with 60% airflow. After the board cooled, it was finally time for the real test. I installed the board on the test bench, powered the system and booted through the GPU to see if it had a display. And this time, it worked. We had a proper image on the screen. With that confirmed, I cleaned the PCB, applied fresh thermal paste, reinstalled all the thermal pads and assembled the GPU back into its cooler, shroud and backplate. Back on the bench, I booted into Windows, installed the drivers and ran my usual stress test. Furmark, Superposition, 3D Mark Nomad and 3D Mark Speedway. All the tests passed as expected, with no crashes or artifacts. The ASUS Astro RTX 5080 was back to its former glory. If you enjoyed this repair and the way I break down the troubleshooting process, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe for more GPU repair content. Make sure that you also click the notification bell so you get notified when I release the next video. If you want to learn more about memory testing on modern GPUs with GDDR6X and GDDR7, check out the earlier video where this exact RTX 5080 first appeared. That's where I go into detail on the test procedure and how I found A0 and B1 in the first place. You can support this channel by becoming a channel member or by using the thanks button as a one-time option. Your contribution really helps keep the channel going and motivates me to create more in-depth repair videos like this. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye for now. Cheers.